Welcome to this live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, Brooke Robertson from BYU's General Counsel Office will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's devotional. We are pleased to have Brooke Robertson, policy manager and analyst in the Office of Integrity and Compliance, as our speaker today. We extend a special welcome to her husband, Aaron, and their family members and friends who are here with us today. I love this practice of the entire campus community taking a prime time hour of the day to come together to reinforce our spiritual selves. I love that we have made time in the busyness of our day to recognize how our studies are amplified by our increase in faith. Please join us next Tuesday at this same time and place for a campus devotional. We will have the opportunity of hearing from Melissa Larson, a teaching professor in the School of Accountancy. We know that you will be blessed as you come to devotional with hearts hoping to understand and to be taught by the Spirit. This morning's prelude was provided by Landon Finch, a junior in organ performance from Elk Ridge, Utah. Sierra Brooksby, a junior studying choral music education from Peoria, Arizona, led us in singing the opening hymn. The invocation this morning will be offered by Stephen M. Sandberg, assistant to the president and general counsel of the university. Immediately following the opening prayer, Grace Tanner, a senior in harp performance from Victor, Idaho, will perform a harp solo entitled, How Great Thou Art. And now the prayer by Brother Sandberg. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful to be here here gathered. We're grateful for the preparation that Brooke has put in for this devotional, and we're grateful to be a community. We ask thee to bless us to remember more fully the goodness of thy son, Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for his precious blood. And we also ask thee to help us to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees, and that all of us together can become more like thy son. And these things we say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Grace, for your beautiful and inspirational music and for sharing of your gifts so generously with all of us here today. We're grateful for that inspiring piece that has so perfectly set the tone for our devotional today. We are pleased today to have Brooke Robertson as our speaker. Sister Robertson is the policy manager and analyst in the BYU Integrity and Compliance Offices, Office, where she oversees the university's policymaking process. Brooke graduated from BYU with a bachelor's degree in American Studies. She earned a master's degree in English from Utah State University, where she also taught undergraduate English courses. Sister Robertson loves to read, hike, do family history, and temple work. She married Aaron Robertson in 2022 and gained six wonderful stepchildren. Following Sister Robertson's remarks, the benediction will be offered by Elizabeth Smith, Program Coordinator for the Global Business Center in the Marriott School of Business and a sister-in-law of Sister Robertson. Now we'll be pleased to hear from Sister Brooke Robertson. I am so grateful to be part of this devoted community of teachers and learners. Brigham Young University has played an important role in my life, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to its inspired mission through my work in the Integrity and Compliance Office. I'm excited to be with you today in this new term and with a wonderful new president, and I've prayed earnestly that the Spirit will edify us in our time together. When you consider the concept of the unexpected, how do you feel? Some love surprises and crave novelty. You may feel excited when something unplanned pops up to change the direction of your day, week, month, or even your entire life. Others love predictability and crave routine. You may feel a bit anxious when unexpected things happen and wonder how things will work out especially for you and for those you love. My family and friends will tell you I am solidly in the latter group. I am a creature of habit. I like to be prepared. When I was an undergraduate student at BYU, my roommates good-naturedly teased me about the level of preparedness I had. My backpack contained not just texts, notebooks, and pens, but also a water bottle, umbrella, snacks, band-aids, ibuprofen, safety pins, hair clips, a whistle. It was basically a mini room of requirement, offering up everything I needed just when I needed it. But my backpack did not have a magical map to help me navigate the unexpected turns my life took during my college years and thereafter. Although some plot twists have been pretty amazing, some have also been so difficult as to push me to the very edge of my abilities and strength. You, too, have experienced the unexpected. The COVID-19 pandemic greatly impacted your high school, college, and mission years, significantly changing your proms, graduation celebrations, internships, work opportunities, and gatherings with family and friends. Other unexpected twists in your life may have rerouted you and left you feeling everything from lost to completely unmade. Today, I would like to share some thoughts on how we can successfully navigate the unexpected. In facing the unexpected in my own life, I have learned that being bound to the Savior Jesus Christ is life-saving. Examples I will share from my life include a significant health challenge, an extended period of singleness, and an unexpected end to that period. To begin, the health challenge. In the middle of winter midterms my junior year, I felt run down. I had a full load of classes, worked as an American Heritage teaching assistant, and spent any free time I had with my roommates and friends. I was busy. It didn't surprise me that I was also very tired. But when I started having to sit closer to the front of the class to see the board clearly and drink water almost constantly to alleviate my dry mouth, seeing a doctor seemed like a good idea. I was completely unprepared for the type 1 diabetes diagnosis I received. 
I was admitted to the hospital with dangerously high blood sugar levels that doctors and nurses worked to stabilize. A diabetes educator taught me how to count carbohydrates and determine and deliver matching insulin doses. When I was released from the hospital, I tried to re-enter my normal life that, it turned out, was no longer normal at all. The settings were familiar. My parents' home, my apartment in Provo, the TA lab. But life within these familiar settings was totally foreign, and it terrified me. I did not have a grasp on the new rules that governed how I had to live. I had been told that if I under-administered insulin, it would damage my body over time. And if I over-administered insulin, I could put myself into a coma. The uncertainty I felt about such common everyday events as eating a snack or drinking anything other than water was paralyzing. I was so scared. Perhaps you may know how chronic illness or other serious physical or mental health challenges feel. Perhaps divorce, death, or a ruptured relationship has torn you or your family. You may have felt blindsided by unemployment and financial difficulties or by serious questions about faith. You may have been abused. You, like me, may have been so scared. Moments like these can be a turning point. What we choose to do next matters, both in the moment and in the long run. We can allow our fear to paralyze us, to persuade us that the ambition we once had for our lives was misguided. We can believe we're incapable and that there's no point in trying since bad things happen to us even when we're trying to make the best choices we can. When we are vulnerable and in pain, it seems so reasonable to give in to this line of thinking. However, we who are blessed with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, he who is mighty to save, can and should make a different choice. We should turn to the Savior for relief and be bound to him. Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Savior invites each of us to be his yoke mate. He promises that with him, the burden we carry will be light. Elder David A. Bednar shared the following. There is no physical pain, no spiritual wound, no anguish of soul or heartache, no infirmity or weakness you or I ever confront in mortality that the Savior did not experience first. In a moment of weakness, we may cry out, no one knows what it is like, no one understands. But the Son of God perfectly knows and understands, for he has felt and borne our individual burdens. And because of his infinite and eternal sacrifice, he has perfect empathy and can extend to us his arm of mercy. He can reach out, touch, succor, heal, and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be and help us to do that which we could never do, relying only upon our own power. Indeed, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. A week after my diabetes diagnosis, I was back on campus and feeling like an imposter in my own life, pretending like I knew how to do it. With my usual confidence shattered, I desperately needed relief. I found a quiet spot on campus and opened my scriptures to Doctrine and Covenants, section 122, a revelation received by the unjustly imprisoned Joseph Smith. There I read, And if thou shouldst be cast into the pit or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? With these words, the Spirit brought to my remembrance what I knew to be true. Christ understood. He felt my pain, my fears, my feelings of deep inadequacy. 
He intimately knew my burden and was eminently qualified to bear it with me. I was humbled by the piercing question, art thou greater than he? As I considered my situation in the context of the Savior's infinite atoning sacrifice, my concerns were immediately tempered. I felt physically lighter. A sacred peace filled me. I was not assured that I would be made well or healed from my illness. Remember, the Savior's burden is still a burden. But I was assured that with him, the burden of diabetes would be light. And miraculously, it has been. With his help, I have made inspired choices that have optimized my health. I've been guided to healthcare professionals who have given me excellent care. Christ has, through this challenge, helped me to gain empathy and patience that allows me to better love my brothers and sisters. I am so grateful for his care. The lyrics of my favorite hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, beautifully sung today, express how I feel about Christ's atoning sacrifice. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Like a well-intentioned but also distractible sheep, I am prone to wander, especially when caught off guard and unprepared. It becomes difficult to see the Good Shepherd and his power when I'm scared. My fears multiply, and before long, the darkness begins to overwhelm me. I want desperately to be kept from wandering, from leaving the God that I love. I know that Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, and he will not leave me comfortless when I cry out. As the hymn's lyrics suggest, his goodness, like a fetter, can bind my wandering heart to him. The choice of the word fetter in the hymn is a curious one. The term generally has a negative connotation. A fetter is a chain or a shackle that restrains and prevents motion. Upon hearing the word, we might envision a prisoner chained in a dank, dark cell, Count of Monte Cristo-like. This type of fettering is not an especially attractive prospect. Let's liberate the word fetter from that imagery. The hymn's use of fetter conveys a depth of meaning much more significant than simply rhyming with debtor. The fetters that bind our otherwise wandering hearts to the Lord are fashioned from the Savior's goodness. They are not heavy iron chains. They are covenants and ordinances that bind us to Him and His pure love and selflessness in the most healing embrace we can imagine and draw us into His warmth and safety. The Lord's covenantal fetters paradoxically give us ultimate freedom if we will wholeheartedly commit ourselves to them. The Savior has promised, I, the Lord, am bound when ye do what I say. What a gift it is to know that when we keep the covenants we have entered into, we can depend upon Christ to deliver the blessings associated with them. With our hearts fettered to Him, we are granted freedom from those things that truly imprison us. Pride, addiction, anger, fear, discouragement, and ultimately the death of our bodies and spirits. He dissipates all that is dark and holds up all that is heavy. Christ eased my burdens in the wake of my diabetes diagnosis. Since I recognized, like Samuel, that I had hitherto been helped by the Lord, I knew I could trust him through another challenge, the unexpectedly extended single adult season of my life. One of the most cherished and fundamental beliefs of our faith is that, through the sealing ordinance, we can be bound together as families for eternity. As a young student, I eagerly looked forward to being sealed in the temple to a worthy companion and together creating an eternal family. But I graduated from BYU single. I had not planned on that, 
and my lack of planning left me feeling adrift. In the ensuing years, I had a lot of questions for Heavenly Father. When at my lowest, they sounded like this. What am I doing wrong? Why can my friends find companions and I can't? And why hast thou forgotten me? These questions were born of loneliness, sorrow, and frustration. In those times, I would have been well served by Sister Michelle D. Craig's words. When hard times come, I try to remember that I chose to follow Christ before I came to earth, and that challenges to my faith, my health, and my endurance are all part of the reason I'm here. And I certainly should never think that today's trial calls into question God's love for me, or let it turn my faith in Him into doubt. Trials do not mean that the plan is failing. They are part of the plan meant to help me seek God. I become more like Him when I endure patiently, and hopefully, like Him, when in agony, I pray more earnestly. The challenge of waiting for marriage did help me to seek God and pray more earnestly. My questions for Heavenly Father became more productive and faith-focused. What is your plan for me at this time, if not marriage and parenthood? How should I be using my talents to build the kingdom? As I listened in stillness, God began answering these questions. He prompted me to undertake a series of very intentional actions in which I offered my heart to Christ, who, in turn, bound me to Him. Personal gospel study and prayer provided me with guidance for my situation. The temple became a beloved refuge. I felt the support of family on the other side of the veil as I engaged in temple and family history work. I wholeheartedly invested in my roles as a daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, building relationships that I cherish. Serving in the primary, Sunday school, young women, and Relief Society organizations gave me additional purpose and community. Consistently engaging in these activities meant that I experienced Christ's goodness regularly. Evidence of His mercy and love is how I maintained a brightness of hope for my future. How grateful I felt to be fettered to the Prince of Peace. We have a large part to play in allowing the Lord's goodness to bind us to Him like a loving fetter. With clear intention, we must dedicate our hearts and our time to experience His goodness. You will remember three ways that President Russell M. Nelson has encouraged us to partner with the Savior. Number one, make and keep covenants. Making and keeping covenants binds us to the Savior like nothing else can. We keep our baptismal covenant by taking upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ, always remembering Him, keeping His commandments, and serving Him to the end. The temple endowment includes covenants to keep the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity, and the law of consecration. Honoring the covenants made in the endowment qualifies members to enter into the covenant of eternal marriage. President Nelson said, The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to His higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes to them through their covenantal relationship with God. Number two, help others make and keep covenants, or in other words, gather Israel. Helping our brothers and sisters make and keep covenants is a deeply meaningful way to experience Christ's goodness. President Nelson said, Any time you do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil, take a step towards making covenants with God and receiving their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. It is as simple as that. That gathering is the most important thing taking place on earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude. Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, enhancing records in the FamilySearch website, 
performing proxy ordinances in temples, encouraging friends in their covenant making and keeping. These are all excellent ways to engage in the most important work of our day and draw near to Christ. Number three, be a peacemaker. We are uniquely positioned in a world full of conflict to be bearers of Christ's light through our peacemaking efforts. I am heartened regularly by members of the BYU community who avoid contention and treat others with dignity and respect. President Nelson said, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to be examples of how to interact with others, especially when we have differences of opinion. One of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately that person treats other people. The Savior's message is clear. His true disciples build, lift, encourage, persuade, and inspire, no matter how difficult the situation. True disciples of Jesus Christ are peacemakers. As we dedicate our hearts and our time to Christ by making and keeping covenants, helping others make and keep covenants, and acting as a peacemaker, we should expect opposition. Satan is motivated to distance us from the Savior by breaking our bond to him however he can. He will try to amplify any pain, fear, and isolation we feel to encourage us to wander. I invite you to resolve to stay faithful and take action daily to strengthen your bond with Christ so he can fulfill for us all the promises and blessings of our Heavenly Father. I would like to conclude today by sharing with you the happiest unexpected happening in my life so far. I met Aaron Robertson in the fall of 2021. Our first date included a hike at Ensign Peak in Salt Lake City. When we met at the trailhead, Aaron had to change out of his cowboy boots and into his hiking boots. I'm pretty sure that's when I started falling for him. Fast forward to a beautiful day in June 2022 when, with the support of Aaron's six children, we were married. Three months later, we were sealed in the Provo, Utah temple. Talk about the unexpected. All those years waiting, I had not imagined that I would find my eternal companion and marry at the age of 42. I also had not imagined becoming stepmother to six wonderful children who have generously made space for me in their lives and who graciously allow me to love them. When Aaron and I met, I had built a comfortable life. I loved working with my colleagues at BYU, spending quality time with my family and friends, and serving with the young women in my ward. I had made peace with being single and was thriving. That being said, I felt absolute peace of mind and heart as Aaron and I discussed the possibility of building a life together. I felt the Savior with me in the choice. He gave me the courage to leave my familiar life and embrace the unfamiliar and sometimes daunting roles of wife and mother. I am so grateful to be bound to Christ. He is helping me every day to learn how to be a new version of myself. As a couple and a family, we have navigated a good amount of unexpectedness in our first year together. The night we returned home from our honeymoon, the children were sick with upset stomachs, every last one of them. Two of the children who felt the worst set up camp in the living room where we had easier access to care for them. In the middle of the night, the younger of the two rolled to the edge of the couch and threw up unfortunately missing the bowl that had been placed on the floor next to her. Aaron carried his daughter to the bathroom to tend to her. At that moment, I realized it would be up to me to clean the floor. <laughs> Here I was, a brand new wife and mother, just back from her honeymoon in an unfamiliar home with an unenviable task. I screwed my courage to the sticking place and resolved to get the job done. Looking around for tools to use, my eyes settled on just the thing, a very wide spatula that was part of a pancake-themed wedding gift we'd received. <laughs> Grabbing the spatula and the bowl that had been left untouched by the couch, I knelt on the carpet and began scraping. <clears throat> 
The child who remained in the room had witnessed the whole scene from her spot on the floor. As I cleaned, she looked me in the eyes and moaned, Welcome to the family, Brooke. <laughs> I have come to expect the unexpected. <laughs> And I recognize now more than ever my absolute reliance on the Savior. I don't know with exactness how his goodness will guide me in the years to come. I just know that it will. President Nelson ended the most recent general conference with this powerful testimony of Jesus Christ. I plead with you to come unto him so that he can heal you. He will heal you from sin as you repent. He will heal you from sadness and fear. He will heal you from the wounds of this world. Whatever questions or problems you have, the answer is always found in the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Learn more about his atonement, his love, his mercy, his doctrine, and his restored gospel of healing and progression. Turn to him. Follow him. It is my prayer that we will heed the prophet's call to know and follow the Savior so that we may be forever bound to him. Connection with Christ is the answer in good times and in bad. I testify of his everlasting goodness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear Father in heaven, we come before thee at the close of this devotional and thank thee for the spirit that we have felt and that we have been taught by today. We're grateful for the testimonies that were shared in music and in word, and we're grateful for the talents that were shared today. As we go forth from this devotional, we pray that we can know the ways that we can change and adjust our path on, on our covenant path, and that we will know by the spirit the things that we can do to more fully live our covenants. We are grateful for Jesus Christ who makes these things possible, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by Brooke Robertson. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with Melissa Larson of BYU's Marriott School of Business. And download the free BYU radio app for episodes of the Finding Center podcast, a daily half hour of inspiration and spiritual focus. Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.